<clears throat> Sorry I sound terrible today. Something happened in sleep. Um, but first of all, uh, thank you very much for, for coming, for, for spending a Friday afternoon with like really beautiful weather. So there were really many better things to do than to be here. But thank you for suspending your judgment and being here. Um, and thanks very much <clears throat> to Stuart, Peter, and Burhan for your kind, kind hospitality over the last two days. I'm very appreciative and very grateful. Um, it's um, maybe slightly ironic um, that uh, Burhan is starting a series on philosophy with a non-philosopher. Because um, I, I, I certainly don't consider myself one. Um, I think I enjoy reading philosophy. I feel a, a, a greater connection to, to literature and to art. Um, um, but we met, as, as Burhan brought up, we met a couple of years ago, I think this was 2012, I'm going to guess, uh, at a very intense paper where, where Burhan was talking about mathematics and um, the French philosopher Alain Badou, uh, who was a teacher of mine at some point. Um, and I was uh, very taken by his paper, and we started a, a long-distance correspondence. Um, um, and the notion of <clears throat> letters, letters and writing, letters and that form up words, and letters as missives, is one that is very dear to me. Both in terms of um, when you send out a letter, not only do you not know where it lands, or who it ends up with, as most of us have done and by sending out wrong emails or wrong SMSs, you know, um, to some tragic results sometimes, you don't really know if it lands. Um, and even if it lands, um, you don't know how it's received. <clears throat> and all of us have also received um, notes, letters, missives, words that have uh, resounded in us many, many, many years later. Um, and I think I'm going to try to address some of that. Um, at least I hope to address some of those concerns, um, either directly or indirectly during this. And um, to, set up, to set it up a little bit, um, <clears throat> which I'll get into uh, more, uh, the context of this was when Burhan uh, very kindly approached me sometime in December to, to uh, do this, to speak with all of you. Um, I had just completed um, writing a piece on an artist, a Singaporean artist called Ruben Pang, whose work you will be seeing as well. And I struggled with that madly. So this piece is a piece of writing about the impossibility of writing, um, which I've called Art and writing, all the ways is sad. <clears throat> to write on art, one must open oneself to the possibility of the impossible. For if art is about the openness to possibilities, perhaps even the moment when the demon whispers into the craftsman and transforms, moves, technically into something else, something beyond, a step beyond, a step not beyond, as it were. And writing is of the order of death, of the scratching, etching, scoring of something into a certain permanence, no matter how momentary this may be. Then to write on art, to attempt to write about art, is to bring together death and possibilities. Or even to open not just <clears throat> the possibility of death, for death is inevitable, but death as a possibility. <clears throat> And maybe as you guys are hearing this terribly scratchy sound, uh, we might be doing some sort of oral etching as we go along. So imagine the difficulty that I was faced, suddenly facing when I picked up my phone last year, on the 22nd of June, and found myself agreeing to the request on the other end, to the voice of one Ruben Palm, without quite understanding what I was saying yes to. After all, when I uttered yes, I had not yet seen the work that I was going to write on. And even as I have a familiarity with his work, all of the work that has come before, this doesn't necessarily mean anything in terms of or in relation to the work that was to come. 
And in fact, all comprehension went out of the window when I opened the file that Ruben sent over just a few minutes later. And I was confronted with this. Suffice it to say, my attempt to write began, though in, all, in some way all attempts to write begin, with a stop, with an inability to write, with a non-writing as it were. And during the point where I was stuck, when I felt I could not begin, when the proverbial ink had ceased to flow, even before it had started, I began walking, moving around, in an attempt to leave, if only momentarily, if only in my mind, the room of phantoms, as Robert Walser might say. For as my dear teacher, Avital Ronel, always reminded me, one has to keep in mind and respect the possibility that the movement of thought in our bodies are potentially entwined. That, since thought quite possibly moves, we might have to move along to it, perhaps with it. A moving that we were attempting during one of during many of our walks, for many of her teaching moments were conducted as we were walking and meandering through the woods of Sarsfe in Switzerland. <clears throat> a walk that was always a little away, apart from the maddening crowd, as it were. A walk that was also away from the trails that Sarsfe itself is, is famous for. The paths up the mountains that echo with the footsteps of Rousseau, Zarathustra the monster who adopts yet declines the name of Frankenstein, Byron, Shelley, Mary Wollstonecraft, Godwin, Nietzsche, among, amongst many others. Thinking with a little distance from everyone else, from all else. For one should bear in mind that the role of the teacher is distinctly anti-public, anti-polis. As Socrates reminds us, the role of philosophy is the corruption of youth not by turning them away from what is good, for the one who loves wisdom is also a lover of beauty and truth, but by opening in them the love of wisdom, by opening thought, thinking, questioning. And here we should attempt not to forget that when he was speaking of love, Socrates was specifically referring to philia, two-way, in relation with, whilst never claiming to fully know another, whilst being open to the possibility of the other which suggests that this is a relationality that is reasoned, reasonable, within the boundaries of rationality, but at the same time always also open to the unknown, the potential unknown, to the potentiality of the unknowable. And we must try not to forget that even though this is a relationship with love, it is not haphazard, not completely relying on chance. There is craft, discipline, technique involved. But even as there is a craft in thinking, even as there is method in this journey of thought, Socrates teaches us that wisdom only comes to one from elsewhere, from beyond, only comes to one at the point where the demon whispers in one's ear. Which means that even as one can attempt to teach another, that even as one might be able to be taught, to be open to the possibility of being thought, taught, the teaching is limited to the manner in which one might approach wisdom. One is not, perhaps cannot be, taught wisdom as such. And if teaching and learning involves an approach, involves craft, this suggests that it, it requires much practice. That it is only through constant repetition, praxis, that one might even begin to develop the skills required to open oneself to the possibility of the whisper. For Socrates never lets us forget, at the point when one hears the demon, it is the craft that becomes art. Nothing said of the craftsman. There is no artist, only the gestures of the possibility of art. At the point of wisdom, there is no teacher, only gestures of the possibility of teaching. Which might be why Avi never sought, never did it, or never sought to tell, to impose upon, to impart even, but instead always only conducted the flow of our thoughts as we moved listening to its rhythms, its rises and falls, its tempo, its time. For we should try to keep in mind that the teacher, the pedagogue, only guides, leads the one who is being taught. Thus it is not a direct transference of information, or even knowledge, but a leading by example, as it were, with the habits of the teacher, and by extension the teacher's body, her habitus, is the very site of teaching. 
which is quite possibly why Martin Heidegger teaches us that the real teacher, in fact, lets nothing else be learnt than learning. His conduct, therefore, often produces the impression that we properly learn nothing from him, if by learning we now suddenly understand merely the procurement of useful information. The teacher is head of his apprentices in this alone, that he has still far more to learn than they. He has to learn to let them learn. The teacher must be capable of being more teachable than the apprentices. The teacher is far less assured of his ground than those who learn are of theirs. <clears throat> Thus the teacher understood in our relationality when they are open to the possibility of learning. And the sight of this potential learning is in, is on, their bodies. Which brings us back to love and the fact that love is the very condition of learning. In the precise sense that even as the one who teaches professes, allowing all echoes of faith and nobility, whispers of the divine even, to resound here, she is always also an amateur. The one who teaches is the one that loves, is one in love, a more Bearing in mind that love always entails a risk, it is never safe, and the one in love opens herself, subjects himself to its dangers. Which means that each moment of love is quite possibly already la part de la, a step beyond and also a not beyond at exactly the same time. Which also means that we can never quite know if we actually know. That truly knowing is always already also unknowable, might well lie in the unknown. Thus, perhaps it is not just that knowing that we know is unknowable, but that unknowability is not only the limit, but always also the condition of knowledge itself. That the foundation, or the upgrown if you prefer, of knowledge is its unknown, where unknowability is not its opposite, its antonym, but its own foregrounding of its limits each time it professes, testifies to its knowing, to knowledge. Which means that each profession of knowledge is always also knowledge testifying to itself, bringing itself forth, telling of itself, attempting to narrate what it is. Thus, always also a moment of fiction, of literature, the writing of itself. Which also means that as one is writing on something, even if one is attempting to, or perhaps especially when one is attempting to respond to the singularity of the work, the object, the person, one might well be writing that very thing, person, object, into being. A being that might have naught to do with what one is attempting to write on or about. That in the very act of writing itself, one might have written on the object of one's writing, in the very sense of writing over it. And here, one must try not to forget that Ruben Pang's works were paintings. For a painting marks, as all paintings do, even remarks, makes a continual mark which says something about a thing, makes a note, remark, on a thing, quite possibly itself. Thus a painting might well be a writing of writing, a staining which marks that it is marking, a darkening as it were, which then releases, frees the very object on which it is remarking in which painting itself might well be in a slanty relationship between the object and what is being depicted, being objectified even, and in that very tangential relationality, in that very swirl, the clear among, what is being liberated is the very object. <clears throat> Where one can only look upon the marks that are made, Remark upon the marks, as it were, but where nothing can be said about the object. Where it is not so much that there is no object to the painting, but that the stains have not to do with the object. Where all we have in front of us is the image made by the stains. Thus to speak of the meaning of a painting, which would require a correspondence between what is in paint and the world, would be nothing short of absurd. Which doesn't mean that what one says has no effects. Even as one might argue that art has no meaning, it is quite possible that, as the experimental filmmaker Jack Smith would argue, meaning has to come out in what is done with the art, 
What is done is what gives it its meaning. Keeping in mind that each time one writes about something, one also writes its context into existence, and perhaps a new framing that has little, maybe even nothing, to do with it. For to frame is always also to potentially accuse someone of something that she might not have done. To pass a sentence on her, hit, hit. And it is following sentencing as it were, branding it, him, her, with letters. What would make a word, every word then? Perhaps a collection, a coming together, a sight, a space, of, for, love. Le mot, le mot. <clears throat> Awaiting reception, awaiting landing. For every letter is already sent, sent off. The moment it is written, it, is already, it has already left one. It has already been committed to, become language, been put into letters. Thus, every letter is always already après la lettre, after the letter. Or perhaps even only becomes a letter at the moment of the letter, becomes a letter during its writing, where it's becoming as inseparable from its lettering, which means that it is only a letter at the point where it is seen, read, as one, the moment it lands. Where it lands up is another question entirely, as is whether it lands. Questions that can only be addressed either retrospectively or if one attaches it to a definite frame of time, if one frames the question in and through a finite period. And even then, that would only be a locating, a location of the letter at a particular moment in time, at, the, at that moment in which it is located, a moment that is perhaps only a caesura in its flight. Thus one could never quite be certain if the letter was going to, just about to, move on, continue, keep moving. Not that one would ever be able to tell the letter that seems to have landed has only stopped momentarily, taken a little rest. Perhaps any attempt to speak of the locus of a letter is one that might be a little too soon, a little premature, potentially too early, before, always possibly, avant the lit. Moreover, since words can be composed of, could only be made up of more than one letter, this suggests that there might always also be multiple missives. Is then the very conception of a word then always already a fixing in place, no matter how momentarily of a word? A homage, perhaps even infidelity, to yet Klein, who in my mind said, the painting is only the witness who saw what happened. A line that I first heard in August 2004 from and through Jojo Agamben during his seminars on the mountains of South Bay at the Rio Grande Graduate School. And perhaps it was apt that this line first reached me, a line that has left its mark on and in me, well, quite literally. Um, even as, perhaps precisely because I have never been able to verify its source, its origin, its author, its author. And it's apt that this line first reached me, first found its way to me in a seminar entitled Homesaka. After all, one is oftentimes moved beyond oneself by something from beyond, something unknown, unknowable, something that the profane is unable to understand, something sacred. Not necessarily divine, but something that maintains its secret. Where the word testifies to itself, its sight, where the word is a gravestone, marking the absence of a letter that has already gone, been sent, flown away. L'amour, l'amour, l'amour. So in a sense, as my dear teacher Chris Krauss would say, love is just like writing, living in such a heightened state that accuracy and awareness are vital. <clears throat> and if love and writing are potentially in a relationship with each other, are quite possibly resounding with each other, the echoes of Roland Barthes' teaching that language is a skin 
I rub my language against the other. It is as if I had words instead of fingers. The fingers and the tip of my words is never far from us. Which opens the question. Even as one thinks, believes, that one is on the same wavelength as the other whom one is writing to, quite possibly in love with, it opens the question of, are we in tune? Can we ever be in tune? Or are we ever, only ever, in tune with? Thus always a relation, in relation, where being in tune is not just being with another, but premise on their being, another. Thus also a touching, where being in tune is a touch. Fingers, words, sounds. Keeping in mind Jean-Luc Nancy's reminder that it is space that one needs to even begin to touch. So even as there are two or more in relation, in a relationality, what one is in tune with is a space between. Attempting to listen to that space, to what is not. Where being attuned, where the tune lies in the knot. Where the dash is precisely the space needed. Never forgetting that even as it connects, it can also break, be dashed. Perhaps potentially detune oneself as one attempts to tune into another. And here we should try to remember, keeping in mind that memories of the order of calling back, perhaps calling forth, certainly a calling, recalling, a touching of the past into the present, that citation is an attempt to resound with the voice of another. Not just in the form of homage, but also an enactment of violence to the other, on another. A touching that potentially wounds, that not only echoes another, but perhaps always already steals, takes over, away, her voice. It's prosopo voya. Hence an attuning, attunement that always also detunes both the self, one, and the other that one is attempting to be in tune with. Attuning that is a relationality that potentially undoes all tuning. A detunement, if you like. And yet both are also already in tune with each other. A tune that can be felt by those in the relation. However, since they are both detuned, this suggests that it is a tune that lies outside the boundaries of nobility. And it potentially beyond cognition. This also suggests that it is a tune that comes to them from elsewhere. A tune that tunes them, that perhaps moves them in manners that remains unknown to them. Auto-tune. And since this is something that is beyond us, perhaps the only thing that we, that one, can say, that is left for one to say is, along the irony that I have borrowed the voice of Jean Genet, the voice of another to say it to resound, nothing I will tell you will enlighten you. I await the poetical expression of what I have to say. So perhaps then, I will have to show you. potential impossibility of seeing a tune. Even if the effects of the set tune, song, might well be visible. After all, it is not as if relationality has a presence. Even if it might be ever present, even if it might be a strong presence between the two or more involved, even if there might not be the notion of a two, of a we without the relation itself. Perhaps then, even as writing on, writing about, is quite possibly an act of love, it might well be a gesture of sending forth. Where what is sent out is not just a relation of love, a statement posting a postcard which is a nod to its love for the other, the object that one is writing about, but the very object that is brought forth in the writing itself. Which brings us back to the initial question. The opening difficulty that I was faced with. How does one respond to sand? To the sound of sand? To shifting sands? For if one can say anything about the work of Ruben Palm, it is that there is an insurrection of sand. Where the art quite possibly lies in the fact that the whisperings of sand potentially transform, move his craft, both his painting and the movement of his brushes 
the alchemy, and the standing of the aluminum beyond itself, where the work takes a step beyond, umpadala, a step that is perhaps always also not beyond. And where, as I looked at the work of Ruben Palm, continually attempted to look at, keep up, keep with the work, the paintings, even when not looking in the direction of Ruben's work, the words started to come to me, to write through me. that might well have always already been there. <clears throat> For even as one might posit, might be concerned about the fact that one might be facing the object as one writes, one can also never be sure if what one writes comes before, comes from the object itself, and that what is written is, <clears throat> and that what is written writes into, onto one, writes over one, writes out one's self. Which opens another question. What is the time of writing? When does writing happen? Keeping in mind that as one scribbles, as there is writing, scriptum, the scribere always also tears, rips, as it makes its mark. Which means that even as one might be able to see the marks that are made, that remain, these are quite possibly the remainders of something that has gone, that is already left, that is beyond what can be seen. But just because the marks, the other marks, perhaps even the marks of the other, are unseen, does not mean that they are completely gone. Thus, there is potentially always already a writing that remains veiled from us, that one is blind to, a what is written that might well be indistinguishable from a writing that is to come. Not just in the fact that one can never quite know if writing has taken place, but that even at the moment of writing itself, even as one is putting pen to paper, as one is typing on a keyboard in front of a screen, even as the proverbial words, text, might be appearing before one, one is never quite sure if all one is seeing is all that is written. Which also mean that, means that writing and waiting might well be indivisible. Not that they are the same, far from it, but that in every moment of writing there is always already a waiting, and that every waiting is potentially a moment of writing which is one of the possible readings of an Etonde Godot. For each evening, when told by the boy that Mr. Godot is not free and will see them the next evening, in choosing to wait, both Vladimir and Estragon are writing the possibility of seeing him. And since they only have a name to go by, and more importantly, a name without a correspondence, which means that not only not, which means not only that he might have already come without them recognizing him, thus missing him, but that if someone came and announced himself as Godot, they would have had to take on faith that it is him. And since all they have is a name, there is no object to their waiting. Thus, in waiting for Godot, not only is Godot another name for waiting itself, all Vladimir and Ostrogon are doing is awaiting the possibility of writing the name Godot. But at the moment in which they, are, they inscribe the name, the letters forming Godot, it is not as if their waiting has ended. For since they cannot know with any certainty who Godot is, any inscription is always already an act of faith. And thus it is not the end of the phase of time, but the very puncturing of time itself. And whilst there is still a relation, after all it occurs through the very same name, the love Godot, a relation that occurs in the same time, as part of the chronology of time as Kronos, it always also escapes its alleged, alleged linearity, knowability. Quite possibly, punctures time, is a punctum in time, happens in, with, within a singular moment, Kairos.
to me. And this might be why even the great archivist, the magisterial thinker of the archive of history, Michel Foucault, the one who is most sensitive to time, to the writings of time, to the power of stories, l'histoire, says, ultimately, I don't write because I have something in mind. I don't write to show what I've already demonstrated and analyzed for myself. Writing consists essentially of doing something that allows me to discover something I hadn't seen initially. When I begin to write an essay or a book or anything, I don't know, I don't really know what it's going to lead or where it end up or what I'm going to show. I only discover what I have to show in the actual movement of writing as if writing specifically meant diagnosing what I have to say at the very moment I begin to write. An echo of which can be found when I was first attempting to write my dissertation, when tuning to Arby, in turning to Arby for advice on how to begin, she reminded me to trust my instincts whenever I was trying to, preparing to, trying to prepare to write and that sometimes the books that happened to be lying on my table, the text that I had brought in front of me, without necessarily knowing why, without necessarily even being conscious of that decision to do so, without being aware of the act of doing so, might offer me an opening into what I was attempting to think about, meditate on. That sometimes not only do the questions that haunt us send us onto, into a quest, but that they also open the possibility, bring with them the potential openings, to or responding with them, and that perhaps the questions that have been opened were opened with them, quite possibly before them, or perhaps even by them. That sometimes all I had to do was to trust that what I was looking for was always already in front of me, that I yet to realize that I was seeing it, that I might have only been seeing or reading blindly. That I might have been blind to the fact that the texts were, always, were already teaching me that as I was reading them, attempting to read them, that they might have, unbeknownst to me, already been writing into, onto me. Thus, writing might always already be nothing than a trust in the relationality, that there is a relationship between writing and waiting. And where, when, at and in the moment it happens, there is no writer, only writing. Where to echo my dear teacher, Elon Siksu, my teacher's teacher, one of Arby's teachers, one of my favorite writers speaking about writing, about her writing, about how she writes. Quickly and without a sound, I pick up a pad that doesn't leave my bedside and, the, and with the large knit pen with which you can write big and quickly across the paper and I note the first lines the coming dictates to me, filling in the darkness, the great page at tremendous speed with this inestimable phrases, leaving of the book, gift of the gods, whose name I don't even know. Where one is transcribing as one is inscribing, whereas Arby teaches us in her wonderful book, dictations, it may well be impossible to tell apart the words, the text of the secretary from the one who dictates, who thinks she is dictating, where one is opening oneself to the possibility of writing as one attempts to write. Where writing is a craft in the precise sense of the role of the one who writes is to practice, continually practice, until one hones one's skills, not to be able to say that one is a writer, that one, <clears throat> not to be able to say that one is a writer, as if it is a matter of being, but in order to open oneself to the possibility of the whispers of the deep. A whisper that might come true anything, even the thing one is attempting to write on, write about, even as the very thing that one is writing about, writing on, potentially remains veiled from one, keeps sliding away from one, around one, like sand. Or perhaps, writing is nothing other than attempting to attend to the wisdom of writing itself.